doing well, and welcome to Homemakers Radio. I hope you can listen to this while you get something done at home. Also, welcome to the Mance. And I'm broadcasting from captivity. And some of you are in captivity too, and you're probably getting a little tired of it, or a lot. And today, I would like to challenge you, as I usually do, to use it to your advantage, the, uh, to your family. In, in your home and yourself in some way similar to the way Joseph did it in Genesis. Remember, he was captive. And Esther in the book of Esther. And Samson in captivity. Remember, he regained his strength um, while in captivity. And the enemy didn't know it. And, uh, of course, we know that was probably supernatural. But I believe we can do it naturally. And uh, the Apostle Paul in captivity, a captive on a ship that was wrecked at Malta in Acts verse, uh, chapter 27. Read about that and see what this captive did. Now, just because we're uh, more isolated doesn't mean that we're not strong. It doesn't mean that we give up. It doesn't mean that we don't grow and that we don't accomplish anything. You don't just sit around and wait to be released. And we can see that all through the Bible. Uh, especially, uh, I'm very impressed with Daniel and Joseph, who apparently, through uh, some people who have researched it, say they were only 17. And they knew at that age how to thrive rather than just wait it out and survive, and how to learn and grow and also to uh, b uh, teach the people around you, and even teach your captors. <laughs> So today, I have quite a few things to talk about. Well, first thing I will go for is your appearance. Now, as you see, I'm wearing a plaid shirt. I live out in farmland in the country, and I've always had the feeling that if I was not in a plaid shirt out here, that I looked like I was putting on airs. <laughs> so some of you that are on homesteads and in, in farms and countries, one, uh, you know this, and ha me having grown up on a homestead in Alaska, that uh, we, we did wear flannel plaid shirts and a lot of denim, but we also made sure we had something pretty on to go with it. We fixed our hair. We um, sometimes had other things about us that, especially us girls, made something more, more girlish and feminine about it. So no matter what you wear, just make sure it's freshly pressed and that it's very clean and uh, that you take care of your appearance first. And I will show you a picture of this. I'm wearing it with a, a skirt that matches it, goes well with it. And I will show you a photograph of it on the, on the post. If you're new here, please click the link in the description box and go listen to this on the post because that's where I will put other things that go with the whole subject today. And it's uh, less distracting to watch it over there. I'm just, I don't have comments on the channel. You may make comments on the post, and if you don't like that, you can go over and find my email there on the left and email me your comment, and I'll post it for you. And so I think that it will, you'll enjoy it a lot more over there in, in that atmosphere. So the first thing you do is take care of your physical appearance to begin the day. It might take a while to get to begin that. Uh, sometimes I'm not really ready to go for my home till noon. I just am becoming very slow. Unless I'm expecting company, I can be very uh, slow. And so in the olden days, when we uh, looked like we didn't care about our appearance and we weren't clean and we didn't brush our hair, we didn't wash our hair, we didn't take care of ourselves, if that were the case, and we didn't pay attention to, uh, we didn't care about our neatness and our appearance, it was naturally assumed that we would feel careless about relationships. We feel careless about uh, jobs and duties and responsibilities and friendships and our house and our possessions. So your, your care of things and your responsibilities, in, a, in essence, begin with getting dressed. You know, when if you remember your children when they were little, how excited they were when they learned how to dress themselves. And they'd go change several times, come out in something new, and uh, it was kind of exciting. It meant a lot to them. And when, when we bought them new things, their posture changed. They were excited. They, they felt different. 
And that's why uh, one thing I want to tell some of you ladies, it doesn't matter whether you're elderly or very young, is don't get boring with your clothing because new clothes make you feel like a new person sometimes. And we need that. We all need refreshment. We all need changes. And clothing in uh, your appearance is the easiest, quickest way to do it. You don't have to change anybody else. You don't have to change the architecture of your house or the uh, design of your furniture. You change yourself first and then others will follow. And so changing your your clothing is gives you a new start. So every day, in fact, the night before, lay out your clothes and think about the mood that the clothes are going to give you because moods, clothing does help moods. You know, the Bible talks quite a bit about clothing. In fact, one of my earliest um, broadcast I discussed all the I went from the front of the Bible to the back of the Bible and I described all the references I could remember uh, where clothing was mentioned and in, including 30 pieces of clothing that were offered as a reward and uh, for both men and women and clothing how it applied to men and women and how you could identify someone by the way they dressed and so your clothing is an expression of who you are and the way you it's not just your clothing you've got to take care of everything else if you're a lady you take care of your com, uh, complexion you use your skincare um, routine and you take care of your hair and you know ladies I know there are a lot of people that object to wearing uh, cosmetics but if you've got blemishes you need to cover them up it might also help heal them and uh, it's very important because those things can be distracting to who you really are and to your message and to your words and the first thing people will see is your face and then the, it moves down your, the, the eyes move downward but your face is what you want to use as part of your the tool for your ministry so your cosmetics your hair care your clothing are part of your tools in this life that God has provided for us to use to portray who we are and how we feel about life there is just something about it and then I years ago when I was a teenager I studied this newfangled thing that was coming out on color color therapy it was called and I was just curious about it and I wasn't going to uh, believe anything that had uh, any kind of philosophy in it that was a contrary to God's Word but I found much of it to be true and when you look through the Bible there were different colors that portrayed different things and different moods and for example blue was the color of the sky it's the feeling of heavenly things and uh, it just kind of yellow is sunny and bright and cheerful and gives you hope and optimism and uh, there were just different colors and there was there were the royal colors and there were the other um, colors that indicated uh, mourning or I mean you know like uh, the loss of someone that kind of morning and so I found a lot of it to be true and so I do pay attention to color I am a uh, seamstress and I have sewn a lot over the years and I have a fabric collection and I'm really looking forward to getting into that and sewing uh, according to what the color the mood that the color puts in me and so all of us should be interested in that as ladies at home those are just some things that help keep our keep our minds happy and focused are how we're dressed have you ever been anywhere and you just weren't quite comfortable in your clothes you just wanted to go home because oh, they're just you just didn't feel good in that outfit and um, so I think that you uh, homemaking it it all starts with what you wear and it is important what you wear in fact it's more important than anything out there than uh, than the workplace school anything that you do that's in the public shopping anything like that what you wear at home because it shows respect to something that God invented and that's the home and the family and uh, being in the house and all the duties that you have the, these were all created uh, uh, the whole concept was created by God and so we need to dress with respect for that now before you go to get dressed or whatever you're going to do I want to share my teacup with you kind of goes with this uh, with this plaid shirt it's a Royal Albert and it's that beautiful blue that is so hard to find I haven't seen very many now uh, the 
Victoria Magazine is advertising an April Cornell set of cups and saucers. I, I don't want them, but I just wanted to, if you're interested in, in something blue, I thought their price was incredibly high, but um, so you can find them. Uh, the question is, are they made of stone, stoneware, or are they made, uh, are they fine china, glassware, or what? Uh, so I wanted to show this to you. Now I wanted to give a compliment to the lady named Janine who left a wonderful comment for me in a previous um, post and she said something that, and I went and looked it up and I looked up a whole lot of other things, that the reason that these handles were small was the idea was to pinch your finger and your thumb together when you held them. You're not really supposed to put your finger in it. So if you've got children and you've got these small Antique teacups uh, encourage them not to put their fingers through them. They could get stuck, but it was to hold together like this. Now somebody asked me, well, why didn't they just make a little flat thing here to, to grasp? Well, that's not the same. It, it wouldn't balance it as well. Your thumb and your fingers have to connect. The other thing is someone brought up to me that the Japanese never had and the Chinese never had uh, handles on their cups. And why did the English put handles on their cups? Well, the... Uh, Orientals didn't like to drink anything they couldn't hold in their hand, and it had to be cool enough to hold in their hand. Well, the British liked piping hot drinks, so they had to have handles. And, you know, these these fancy teacups actually went to war with some of their military. They were on ships, and uh, the farmers had them, and uh, they were all over the place. And so they had a quite a rough life. So they... Uh, the teacup was very important at that time, even in America, and uh, so we had to have handles on ours because we wanted hot drinks, piping hot drinks, and that's how. And I read a history of this on how the handles went through a, a period of trial and error, as many of them uh, often broke off. But they finally reached a, a, a way, a method that they could get them to stay on and, and be quite sturdy. So anyway, thank you, Janine, for mentioning that. I was very glad to hear that. Um, but it wouldn't have done any good to have filled this in and then pinched it like that because you have to. There's more balance if you have to put your fingers to your thumb and do that. But certainly be careful about putting your fingers through these small handles. They weren't designed for that. So I want you to know that. So now that you have seen my teacup, you can go and get dressed, and um, in, in your in your dress, um, in your dress, in the way you dress. I think that you should include your mood lifters. Now, one of the mood lifters that I've discovered is the uh, stretch and breathe type exercises. And you know that I um, chose one lady that I like to see what she's doing and I chose her chair exercises and her stretch exercises because they increase they increase your mood your your happy hormones she calls them and I didn't always understand that but as I have been using that uh, I have I would encourage you to find one that you like I have followed the lady in Australia fabulous 50s now you're not going to like everything that these people no matter who you choose you're not going to like uh, everything they post uh, you're probably going to object strongly to some of it, but I am looking for something that works with me and uh, I am careful what I choose. And also that uh, if you do wear skin care and makeup and, uh, and, you, and you're careful with your hair products and things uh, like that, that sometimes it's better to get yourself all fixed up, get yourself bathed and all fixed up, put on your makeup and fix your hair, and then do these exercises because it sets it sets the skin care and the makeup. When you start exercising, your face warms up, and it's, uh, it's really, I, I practiced that because someone told me that years ago, and I read it somewhere too, that it's very helpful. So do your exercise, you'll warm up and... Uh, it puts a glow on your face. Now homemaking is not all work and let's make sure you know that because as I sit here I'm surrounded by I'm, I live in my place of work and it can get you've got to be really careful not to just turn it all into mechanical work and so because it is it is very interesting that uh, my workplace is the same as my home 
it's not the same as someone working at home that has an office and they're they're doing a different kind of work my work and your work at home is your home so there's a whole different uh, dynamics there and you've got to be careful not to make it all work when we were younger uh, my mother would hurry up with the basic work you know the dishes the sweep the floors make the beds do the laundry hang it out and then we would go somewhere we would go pick berries or we'd go fishing or we'd go wherever you know go groceries whatever uh, because it, it's not all about uh, staying there all the time and it is a place that you kind of uh, use as your base but it doesn't have to be all work now of course now that we're captive the home is even more important it is, it is more important as a place of refuge a place of rest and place, place of recreation and a place of joy and the only way to get it that way is to keep it organized orderly and clean and pleasant and not let things stack up so bad that uh, that you want to leave so what I would suggest especially if you're young at home you're a teenager you're with your mother at home and whether you're a uh, boy or a girl this is an important habit to get in your life it will help so much uh, when you leave home or when you get married because you will never have a uh, you don't have to save things for a work day or a stress related cleanup uh, if you will clean as you go and pick it up don't pass it up clean as you go means even when you're meal prepare, pre preparing meals here's one of the problems is people prepare meals and then they sit down and eat it and then their 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 energy is gone and they're just exhausted and they they have to wait for a while to do the cleanup so the best thing to do is clean as you go so that means whatever you cook in your cookery uh, if you've taken the ingredients out and you put them on some, somewhere else a serving dish whatever or a plate you go ahead and wash it and or put it in the dish clean it rinse it and put it in the dishwasher get all that cleaned up if you are taking ingredients out of your cabinet and you're, you've got you know a can of can with something in and a bag with flour in it and that sort of thing put it back and clean up the what what have you have dropped clean up the flour and the excess make it clean as you go so that if you're ever interrupted and uh, there, you won't have a big mess that you have to leave it's always presentable or if you ever have it um, an inst uh, instance where you have to leave the kitchen or you have to leave the food preparation that things are pretty well organized now one of the things that I like to do this is just my little household hint if I've got a bag of carrots I will go ahead and uh, cut the tops and the bottoms off and and peel them and then put them with a paper towel and a little water in it and stick it in a one of those uh, they call them Tupperwares but they call them other things too little plastic dishes with the lid on it with the airtight lid and stick them all in back in the fridge that way I don't have to peel that each time I need one and other things is you can prepare means you you pre-assemble it prepare it so that you can just get those things out if you do a lot of stir-fry like I do or sauteing I like to have all those things already peeled and prepared and put in little dishes in the fridge and then I can get them out and use them uh, also it if you will just watch what you're doing and be very very well organized so that when everyone sits down to eat or wherever they eat uh, the kitchen the cooking part has been cleaned up at least all the ingredients put back in the fridge and the cabinets dry ingredients put away cabinet wiped off and the dirty dishes rinsed and put in the uh, dishwasher and then it's not so daunting when you finally have to clean up the plates one thing that I do that maybe you don't I'm very sensitive about my old pipes the old uh, my old plumbing system I want to be very careful and we have a septic out here and I really enjoyed getting such a good report card on my on the pH balance of my septic that I am very careful I take a paper towel or a napkin and I wipe off all the plates into the burnable trash uh, and then I'm very careful not to let too much go down the drain and uh, I don't want to use it uh, I don't want to overload it with things like that and that way when they're in the dishwasher it doesn't clog up the dishwasher and so I'm very careful to do that and keep the place a little cleaner I use vinegar 
uh, to do my laundry with and also as a rinse in the laundry because it there's no chemicals in it and uh, it the smell goes away of course but it's a lot healthier to breathe and it also is easier on the clothing those are just some household hints they're not for everybody and in fact nothing I say is uh, is something that you have to do I am just keeping you company while you work you don't have to live like I do in fact if you follow anybody and you're very very uh, dedicated to the way someone else does something because you don't you didn't develop the knowledge yourself then you end up having a lot of the same problems they had and so uh, I think it's better to discover some things by yourself in for the home for what works better for you and for your family uh, but it's, it's nice to take ideas from other people but don't ever feel that they're being pushed on you so I think that we can come out of the other side of this um, activity uh, more level-headed with more patience uh, with stronger families closer and and more uh, loving towards each other and not so much we, we don't have so much interference we could actually accomplish that and there's not so much competition now with the world uh, there's not so much competition with other people so now we can be go begun to develop real relationships with our children and with our family we can be healthier uh, because we're not subjected to all the all the things that would in, uh, interfere with our health and we can be more orderly and we can develop better habits we can be more knowledgeable we can come out of this more skillful and more creative and more physically fit and uh, more well spoken with better manners and refined and maybe younger <laughs> so uh, I think that all these things, the homemaking especially, uh, can help us. You can use it. You can use the homemaking as a stepping stone for bettering your habits. And especially if you're young at home and you're living with your parents, I think it's really important to develop the pick it up, don't pass it up, and clean as you go, so that you, so that after a while, you've developed such a habit that you can't not do it. You can't refrain from doing it. And that way. When you do have your own home, you don't have these old habits. You know, you should always learn to keep a spick and span room and to clean up after yourself in the bathroom and in the kitchen because you'll have to deal with that if you have bad habits. When you get your own home, you'll have to deal with that. You'll wonder, why is everything stacking up and why is it such a mess? So you, learn, you need to learn that and then you'll never have to have rarely have to have a cleanup day unless you've been away been sick or there's been a lot of commotion in your house and so learn to clean as you go and so develop good habits so that you won't have difficulty uh, and you won't have too much tiredness after after preparing things another thing that I had as a hint was uh, the fact how much you, you've heard how I don't like Febreze and I don't like Downy and I don't like all these smell the smells that they have in uh, in laundry preparations and uh, house cleaning products and I don't like Lysol I don't like anything like that and uh, so in that respect I I don't miss travel and I don't miss staying in motels and hotels because they have all that stuff on everything and they have this carpet spray and everything it's just awful and um, because you develop a, an allergic to allergy to it after a while. At first, I didn't notice it so much, and it seemed quite pleasant. But now I can't stand it. So I got to thinking uh, that I would consider making my old-fashioned an old-fashioned linen spray for uh, ironing. Remember, we used to have a bottle of water, put a drop of uh, something in it, like rose water or uh, something else and so you spray it on the clothing and I lived before permanent press <laughs> and so we would spray this on it and then iron it and believe it or not we had an iron that we heated on the stove that was really way back wasn't it um, eventually we did get an electric iron though but I remember way back there with the ones that we heated on the on a cast iron cook stove 
and I remember how heavy they were. Um, so consider making your own uh, old-fashioned linen spray. There are recipes online for natural linen sprays that don't have any chemicals in them. And, you know, consider making a linen spray because you could spray the inside of uh, drawers that get all stuffy and smelly, and you can use it as a for drapes. You can use it on uh, your your upholstery, anything like that. So that's just one of my hints for today. So if you're very low in the pockets, <laughs> very slender in the pockets, you can uh, make your own things, your own cleaning products and your own sprays. Now, I don't use any cleaning products other than vinegar. Once in a while, I'll use uh, one of those uh, dishwashing liquids in a spray bottle with water that have, it doesn't have the phosphates in it. And uh, it'd be things like downy and some palm oil it is like that. And I'll use that on some things, especially in washing dishes by hand. I want to move on now to homeschooling, so I can homeschool you a bit. I don't care how old you are. You, um, you probably would benefit from it. But I wanted to emphasize something about homeschooling. If you've got any ideas that you just order some books and then you, you behave like a teacher and you teach your children at home, that's not homeschooling. Imitating the public school system will surely bring strife to you. The thing is, you can teach your children all kinds of facts from books and they can fill out all the, the blanks and answer all the questions and write papers on it and everything. But what you're trying to achieve is more than just head knowledge. Because you can bring them up with rules and education without bonding uh, in love and so the people in the home will, will not be fully developed emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and even physically because homeschooling is for you too. It's for you, uh, the one who's doing the teaching. And then you develop things like patience. You develop things like understanding. And you develop love and loyalty for your children. And you, you need to bond together because you're all going to be a force of strength together against uh, the part of the world that wants to destroy the home or wants to uh, make you at war with one another. And so you've got to avoid teaching in such a way that it puts you in strife with your child. So if you have a, if you've ordered stuff and you have a curriculum you're following and, the, and you're feeling like you don't really, you're not really interested in it and you don't like it, irritates you, and you can tell that the children aren't uh, blossoming and responding to it, just get something else. You're not obligated to follow something just because it's in a curriculum or a book. You can also write your own. And I uh, think that that is so great that we are in the era of the uh, internet because we can look up some things that are not in the books. And one of the things um, that I wanted to tell you is, first of all, homeschooling is for the parent as well because you're going to develop good character, patience, goodness, and kindness. So homeschooling is for the period, for the purpose of discovering and enjoying the life that God gave us and giving God the glory and the credit. It's for learning to love each other and just enjoying being alive. So consider that. And also, uh, one of the things that you learn is that those school books that you get, they're great, you know, from uh, the homeschool companies or the private school companies. You get pretty good books, but they're general, and they certainly don't tell everything. Now, uh, for, for instance, geography. Geography was, was pretty good. It would tell you the difference between an inlet and a bay and a continent and an island, and, and these are important. These are really important. And But then let's go a little bit further. The other day, uh, which I had never uh, studied this, but because of Miss Lily of the Valley, that famous authoress that uh, is a uh, is number one on the uh, Pioneer bestseller list, um, she was writing about Allison on the Oregon Trail, and I got to thinking about that. Why I I had heard about it once when I was growing up in a book in our school library uh, about 
the pioneers, but not much in detail. And um, of course, Hollywood uh, really did promote the Oregon Trail and the uh, the series Wagon Train. You can still watch that, you know, on YouTube, Wagon Train, and all the characters that were involved. And uh, but then I got to wondering about other trails. Certainly, there must have been a trail from the east to Tennessee, and of course, uh, in other continents too. I read about the trail. I believe they were called the Vortrekkers, Trekkers, and they went from uh, they went to South Africa, and all the things that they did, uh, they were pioneers too. And there were other trails. There was a trail from uh, the East Coast in America to Texas, and that was called the Southwest Trail. And then there was the uh, Cattle Trail, the Chisholm Trail. And so I got to looking up all these things, and I wanted to find out if there had been a trail to Kentucky. So uh, because you know. Uh, my friend might want to write another story about some other children <laughs> on a on a wagon train, and so I looked it up, and you know what came up? This word called trace, and it was a uh, it was the Southwest trace, or it was the Chisholm trace. Well, what is this word trace? Well, that was never in any of our homeschool books, so I thought, well, I'll have to tell you children about the word trace because. Uh, it was what it was. It's a it's a trail, but it's it's a very wide span of land, very wide swath of wilderness, in which there are traces of uh, other civilizations, like things that are left from um, from uh, different tribes, different native tribes that were left. Oh, pottery, uh, knives, arrowheads, clothing, anything that you could find. And it was called a trace, and it was a trail actually, and you could follow this trail, this trace, along a, a certain amount of certain mileage, and it would take you to uh, Texas, or it would take you to uh, from the East Coast to somewhere else, and they were called traces. Well, there are other traces too, and that's uh, I understand has something to do with the reins of uh, the. Uh, horses and the team of horses. You might want to look that up too, but there's that word trace. And I imagine it has other meanings too. Uh, when you trace something, uh, you are looking for something. You're, you're, you're tracing it. You're tracing uh, a path or someone's footsteps and you're tracing them. And it's the same with tracing paper. So I wanted you to know about that today was uh, your education is in the word trace. So you might want to look that up too. So instead of uh, trail uh, in the early days and in the other states, it was called a trace. So I thought that was a, a new one for me, but that would not have been in our books. And there, are, there's a lot of history that you can find in museums from books that they sell that are not in homeschool books that would be very good. And we did buy some of them on our way uh, on some of the trips that we took. We did buy some of the books that were in museums and in um, tour houses that were historical, historical tour homes, we would buy their literature because it gave us a history. And uh, so that is that is what homeschooling is all about: is looking for, looking for learning, looking for information, looking for life, and learning about it. And you don't have to be tied down to the prescribed books. Uh, as long as you can teach reading and writing and uh, arithmetic and spelling, you can use anything. Like I said, you could use the first verse of the Bible and develop a whole a whole uh, art journal over it. And so, so the Constitution was something that I mentioned of the United States. Every every good country has uh, something like a Constitution. And I mentioned last time, it's very important for you students to remember that our Constitution did not create our rights. It reinforces the rights God already created, the right to life and liberty. And uh, th that just says it all, doesn't it? Life and liberty. And God gave us the ability and the duty to uh, have communi to communicate and uh, for transportation. That, those were things that came natural. And those things cannot be taken away from us. And if they are, they're against the Constitution, which reinforces that God-given 
plan and that God-given right. And that's what our Constitution does. And it says uh, in the beginning that uh, all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator uh, with uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And part of the pursuit of happiness is being able to work in a in some kind of field that you enjoy uh, or that uh, uh, gives you a challenge. And uh, people should not be forced to do things that they don't want to do or be shut down so that they cannot communicate or that they cannot transportate. Those things are so important because God wants his word to go out and to be spread abroad. And you can't do that if you are if you are given a gag order. So any any governor, any prime minister of a state that forbids uh, life and liberty, they are um, against God's will. And the only way to uh, put a stop to them is to unelect them. And there are many governors uh, here in the U.S. now who are going who are being unelected. So. I don't know where they're going to live. I don't think there's enough room for them in some of these uh, spas that prisoners go to. <laughs> and one thing I wanted to talk about too is commercial things like um, commerce, which I said was taught from the very beginning of the Bible because Adam was uh, told to uh, tend the garden. Later on was told to work uh, to earn his bread. And when uh, a despotic government, a tyrannical government, forbids people to work, you know that that's totally against nature. It's against God's law. Man naturally, people just naturally want to do something and uh, need money and need to earn it. And so, and so God gave in them, in people, a desire to uh, to work so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the businesses that did stay in business and it's very uh, curious well not curious but pretty typical that the ones that uh, shut down were the private ones and it gave all the all the uh, business to these big box stores that are controlled by the CCP and so what that what they forgot about, though, you know, they, they, they really thought they were pretty smart taking over all these businesses. And, and the uh, income went way up in some of these businesses because that's all the choices we had. And, in fact, even before this, that there were some of these big box stores that that, that was the only choice we had. And uh, But what they forgot was that when they treat, in America especially, how you treat the customer uh, makes your money or breaks you. And if you lose your customers, because people just don't want to be treated bad, if you lose your customers by speaking sharply to them, by ordering them about, and uh, by threatening them, and by giving them so many rules, telling them where to stand and where to sit and what to do and which way to go, uh, you lose a lot of customers. And that's what's happened to some of these big stores that were really profiting from this uh, strange, uh, strange political situation that we're in. Well, what happened was they're losing a lot of customers. And you know that uh, communists need money to keep the communism going. And without these customers, they're not going to have the money to run some of these stores. So there's going to be some very interesting changes around here. But we were always taught when we were growing up that your customer is your living. So you have to be kind to them. If you want them to come back, they have to have an ex a good experience. I mean, who wants to... Uh, trade with someone who just treats them like trash or, or shouts at them, you don't want to ever go back, do you? You don't, you don't want them to have your business anymore. And that's the way we talk. You know, they say money talks. Well, our hard-earned money that uh, God enabled us to earn, we're not, a, we're not really supposed to throw it away. We have to be very careful what we do with it. And so we're careful not to spend it in places where we're not satisfied with the service or with the products or with the attitudes of those who are serving us. That's just my opinion. You don't have to you don't have to believe that. And but your experience counts too.
Now I want you to look up a, a phrase and it's called uh, well-spoken. You know, people who are well-spoken, that doesn't mean that you can uh, give a speech. I believe that it means uh, people who speak with uh, good grammar and knowledge, well-spoken, and kindness and politeness. And I want to talk to about people a little bit here. And that is one of the things that, a, a phrase that should never be in a, in any kind of conversation where you're trying to persuade each other. And that is right in the middle of a conversation where someone's making some points and putting out some evidence and uh, trying to show some logic and something and the other person is disagreeing. The one that's disagreeing when they find out that they're wrong or they're losing or that, that the points uh, make a lot of sense and that their position um, doesn't have the facts behind it will say something like, you are wrong. Now, you are wrong is not a persuasive statement. It's not even, um, it's not even anything that shows evidence. The words, you are wrong, doesn't mean anything. It has nothing to back it up. And so what you have to do is avoid that statement, you are wrong, and show how they're wrong. Show how this works better this way or this is this doesn't make sense or God's word says this therefore this thing is wrong but I don't think it's really polite to say that the person is wrong you are wrong you'll have to say what you're saying is wrong or the uh, belief that you have is wrong because this is what this says and this is what this says and put some proof behind it but I think it's very insulting for someone to say you are wrong because uh, as a person, uh, I might not be wrong. I just might be thinking something wrong. And uh, I've seen this happen in uh, someone who, a religious discussion maybe, where someone who has been reading something about the scriptures and then concluded something that was completely uh, off and completely wrong. And someone tried to point it out to them and say, well, look. That belongs. That statement belongs to the previous sentence, which was talking about this. Therefore, it couldn't have been talking about what you're saying it's talking about because it goes with the whole chapter. You know, I've always encouraged you, read behind it and read in front of a, of a verse. Don't just take a verse out of context, but read, the, read around it so that you understand its full context, its full meaning. But I have seen people who want to believe something or push a belief on someone, and they will... Uh, go way over here and find a verse in the Bible uh, that they say connects to a verse way over here and not read all around it. And then when someone tries to point it out to them that that went with that or that that was talking about something else and shows them, they will say, you are wrong. <laughs> and that just, that's a way, see, that is somebody who's weak. That is a way of dismissing you and dismissing your, the, the teaching that you're trying to give them or any kind of help you're trying to give them, they're dismissing you and they're calling you wrong. But you shouldn't be too insulted by it. It's not you that's wrong. It could be a belief that's wrong. It could be a misreading something that's wrong. It could be an action that, that you have done or they have done that's wrong. But uh, you shouldn't be uh, too upset about it because they don't know how to reason. Anyone who just uh, says you are wrong is not reasoning. They are not reasoning anything. They are not uh, trying to share uh, facts. They aren't trying to share anything. They just said you are wrong. And I just don't think that it's a it's good. I don't really think it's very refined for ladies to do that. Um, but uh, maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. And probably only if you have experienced it can you figure it out. Uh, so don't be too upset. I am just trying to keep you company while you work. So I hope you haven't sat here and just uh, watched me because there isn't anything to see here. And I've been trying to just talk long enough for you to clean one room. Now, if you have a resistance to homemaking and housework, then I would suggest us the most fun thing you can do is to find ways to enjoy it. 
and I have told people that if you will find a way to make it into a this, the job that you have, let's say you're from a family and you're about 15 years old and you have been assigned to do all the bathroom or something, instead of just uh, just doing the mechanical work of cleaning it up and it feels like drudge, turn it into a work of beauty. Add something, um, fold the towel a certain way. You know, I, I got on the web one night and learned uh, different creative ways to fold towels, the ones that hang on the little rack, and thought that I might just put one up that was different. And just uh, to take a, a room that normally is a banal sort of uninteresting place and to turn it into something nice. So if you have a resistance to housework or homemaking, then find ways to enjoy it. That's why I say get dressed up first because that's the beginning of enjoying it. The other thing that I would suggest is to wear one of the uh, the bib aprons that have that cover this part of your dress or your shirt because that's where you're going to get dirty. I never really I'm fairly tall and I never really understood these um, little skirt aprons because it didn't really <laughs> cover the part that I was having a problem with. So if you have if you have a resistance to homemaking, then you have to change your attitude. And if you find out that you're, feel, you're still feeling kind of uh, irritated by it, try the, st the stretch exercise. Often we have a pinched muscle or we have a, uh, maybe some stiffness, and those exercises can help a lot in changing your mood and changing your attitude. Another thing that you can do is Create something that you're looking forward to when you're finished. And you say, okay, afterwards, after we finish all this and after I finish my part, we're going to sit down and set the table with the, our finest tea set and have a cup of tea and talk about some things. Make a list of things you'd like to discuss, you'd like to talk about. Ideas. Have ideas. You know, I've got this old secretary desk here. And the other day I had an idea that I would put my shop in there. And that means I would put things that I'm not using anymore, maybe a teacup that has a bit of a flaw in it or that I'm just not using anymore, and put all that in there with tags on it and a little price tag, and it would just be 25 cents. But it's fun to have your friends over and have them open the doors of your shop and uh, and buy something from you. And I'll, I'll have an old songbook in there. Or I'll have... Uh, just things that maybe I didn't get any use out of and they're almost brand new or things that I have made, you know, little pot holders, little whatever. And so just write down, sit down together with your tea and make uh, a beautiful day of it and write down opportunities and ideas so that you can go a little further with your life than, than quote, just housekeeping. Because um, your life should never be just housekeeping. You are home making. And so your house, see, the thing is, this is our work. We're sitting in the place where our work is. And so it's very hard sometimes to relax at home. This is why the men in the 1950s made sure their wives got out regularly for uh, a day out or a shopping trip or they took them on a ride or a ho uh, holiday because they needed to get away from the work at home. But since many of us now are in captivity, then we have to make our home vacation-like. We have to make it better than the highest-end hotel that you've ever seen. Uh, I do go online sometimes and look at some of these, like the Empress Hotel and and that uh, that uh, connect collection of hotels and just kind of get ideas from it. And I've read a book about it. And uh, so you're going to have to do that because this is your vacation home too. And uh, you can create different atmospheres out, out of it. You know, sometimes in the winter, when the wind is blowing, the snow is all out there, I like to make it into a, um, a cabin retreat or a mountain retreat. And then in the summer, I'll make it into um, some other kind of resort. And so it isn't just uh, housekeeping. It isn't just grueling work. It will entail some of it. But if you learn to clean as you go, then it's not so much a work day and the work is a lot less. For example, when you're using the, anything in the bathroom, you can clean the tub and the shower when you're in there. You can clean the sink. You can clean the floor. You can clean anything in there so that it doesn't become 
uh, a major chore later on. You don't want to let the dirt pile up. One of the things I really liked about raising, having children at home was that you, did, you really did have to clean constantly because they required so much more care and the bedding had to be changed more often and the clothing had to be washed and, uh, and they had to be bathed and so there, everything was constantly being cleaned up. But you can still do that even if you live alone and you're older. You can do that and you can just think of yourself as expecting someone. You can, uh, and then you will find that your mood is a lot better and your creativity will be uh, more activated. So ladies, I hope that this has helped and that you have gotten a few things done while you've uh, gone. And this is for all ages. This is for you if you're home with your mother or your home taking care of your, uh, your mother's home with you and you're taking care of her. This is for you if you just can't get started. This is for you if uh, you need some company while you work. I have my favorite things to listen to and never listen to me. But uh, you might like it, and I hope that you get a lot of great ideas for yourself. And carry a little list with you. Stick it in your apron pocket and uh, put a little pencil or pen in there. And as you're working, if you are clean something, get an idea you want. The other day, I thought of a new... Um, I don't know what you call them, but they're these little things you put a, a drop of essential oil in it and, it's, and it steams a room. And I thought of a new way to use that in a corner of the house. And uh, I just wrote it down so that I would uh, do it. And then I will also write down things that I'm running out of that I need and put on my list for the, for the, uh, for the shopping. I order a lot of things and Mr. S brings home things for me because he has to go out for various things and uh, he doesn't mind stopping and getting them for me. So ladies, I hope you're having a wonderful time or at least you'll begin having a wonderful time. Go and get dressed and uh, let's get busy and I'll talk to you later. Bye.